start now. I can start now? Yeah. Okay, I'll end the call then. Okay, alright then. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. See you. Bye. Okay, talk to you later. Bye okay, bye. bye. So, hi, my name is Clara Fong and I'm a final year medical student and today I'll be teaching cardiology um, and there's lots of topics we need to go through today and I have them here on the next slide. So, today um, what I'm going to go through would be topics like heart sounds, valvular heart disease and endocarditis, rheumatic fever, heart failure, acute circu circulatory failure and shock, pericardial disease, cardiomyopathy, and congenital cardiovascular disease. So, um, uh, I hope you're prepared. It's going to be around an hour and a bit more. And I do have some questions at the end that we can go through just to test our knowledge. And if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to type in the comments box and I'll read them and I'll answer them maybe towards the end. Um, I'll try not to read off the slides too much. I know no one really likes that. And I'll just try my best to explain some of the concepts we go through as well. So to start off with, um, I'm going to talk about heart sounds. So the basic heart sound S1 and S2, um, I hope we're all familiar with that. So S1 is the closing of the mitral and tricuspid valves, um, or the AV valves as we call it. And S2 is the closing of the aortic and pulmonary valves, or semilunar valves. So you might have heard of something called uh, splitting. So splitting is when you can hear basically S2 separated into two sounds. And it can be physiological or pathological. Uh, physiological is usually heard in young adults like you and me. And um, basically, when that person breathes in, you can basically hear what you hear is the aortic valve closing before the pulmonary valve, and that's called physiological splitting. Um, obviously, this can be pathological as well. So in some conditions, you can hear widened splitting, such as if there's um, pulmonary hypertension. Um, and also, you can hear something called reverse splitting as well. And that is actually splitting that is heard during expiration. And this can happen in conditions such as uh, severe aortic stenosis. Um, this is something you need to uh, something you should keep in mind because when you do uh, OSCEs, when you examine a patient, you're not just listening for the presence of S1 and S2, you're listening to how loud the sounds are and whether there is splitting or not. So the next thing I want to go through is um, gallop rhythm. So by that I mean heart sounds S3 and S4. Um, so S3 is the heart sound. Uh, a heart sound that you hear in early diastole right after S2 and it is associated with a rapid ventricular filling so um, just blood rushing really quickly into the ventricle and also associated with dilated ventricles as well. Uh, I've heard it once and it was in a patient with heart failure. However, it can be normal in children and young adults and pregnant women so you do have to uh, examine the rest of the patient and look out for other signs that might point to heart failure such as peripheral edema. So S4, um, this is a pathological heart sound for sure. Uh, it happens in late diastole and it happens because the atrial contracts against a stiff ventricle and that means there's ventricular hypertrophy. So the next thing I want to go through is murmurs. So um, with murmurs, um, there's two different categories you can divide them into. So again, there's physiological murmurs and pathological murmurs. So for physiological murmurs, this would be um, this is usually a systolic murmur. It can happen in conditions which have a uh, generate high cardiac output, such as in pregnant women. Uh, if you have thyrotoxicosis, um, hyperthyroidism, or if you have a fever as well. Then the other category is pathological murmurs. So they can either be caused by stenosis, leakage, so that's regurgitation, or shunting, so that's things like septal defects. And we divide these pathological murmurs into you know, systolic, diastolic, and continuous. And we'll be discussing more of the systolic and diastolic ones. 
So here on the right, I have a table um, which puts like divides these systolic and diastolic murmurs, and you can see examples of those underneath each category. And the next thing I'm going to do is talk about these murmurs, how we differentiate them, and what are their characteristics. So this is a quite a busy table. I really apologize. Um, I'll do my best to explain what is going on in this table. So this table is for systolic murmurs. So when you read a question and it says you hear a systolic murmur, the first thing you should check is what the characteristic, when are you hearing it? So you can hear it as an ejection, a systolic murmur. So that's a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. A pansystolic murmur, it's present throughout S1 and S2. Or a late systolic murmur, so that's towards, like, at the end of the S1, S2. So looking at ejection systolic murmurs, I've put here aortic stenosis, hokum, which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and pulmonary stenosis. Um, these three are ejection systolic murmurs. And the, in the notes bit is how we try and differentiate it. So aortic stenosis, as we know, radiates to the carotids. It's best heard in the aortic area, so right, uh, second intercostal space on the right. And we can do certain maneuvers to make it louder or make, you know, try and make it louder or make it softer. So for aortic stenosis, um, it is louder when you ask the patient to squat down. And because this is because when they squat down, um, more blood flows into the heart and therefore more blood flows, tries to flow through the aortic valve and therefore aortic stenosis sound would be louder. It is quieter if you ask them to do a valsava maneuver or if you're trying to ask them to do hand grip. Because for valsalva, uh, the preload decreases, and for hand grip, the afterload, so the resistance afterward increases. So that's why it's quieter for aortic stenosis. Hokum is similar to aortic stenosis because it's both ejection systolic murmurs. However, hokum is louder during a valsalva maneuver and quieter during squatting and hand grip. Uh, you can hear it loudest in the left sternal edge. Um, this is something you would ha there's no sort of quick way to remember it, but it's something you should learn. And I hope that explaining those squatting and valsalva and hand grip can help you better understand why the murmur changes, the intensity of the murmur changes with these maneuvers. For pulmonary stenosis, this is a right heart valve disease, and with all right heart valve mur uh, murmurs, they're usually louder during inspiration. So for pulmonary stenosis, you can see I've put louder during inspiration. And in terms of pansystolic murmurs, we have mitral regurgitation. So this is a, they usually call it a blowing murmur. Um, it's heard in the apex and it can radiate to the axilla. And it's louder during hand grip and squatting. For tricuspid regurg, um, again, this is a right side, right heart valve um, murmur, so again, it's louder during inspiration. And then ventricular septal defect. So this is a harsh sounding pansystolic murmur that is loudest in the left sternal edge. And usually it can radiate to the right parasternal region as well. And again, hand grip and squatting can make it louder. So the last one is mitral valve prolapse. So this one, it's a late systolic murmur. And um, you can you can usually hear a mid-systolic click. With the maneuvers, it's um, again, it's similar to hokum, where it's louder during valsalva and quieter during squatting and hand grip. Um, this is something that can come up in um, finals, in finals exam question. It has come up before, asking about murmurs and then uh, mentioning the maneuvers. So it's something you should uh, read up on or, and learn. So the next thing is diastolic murmurs. So here I have um, less than the previous slide. Hopefully that's reassuring. So aortic regurgitation, that's an early diastolic murmur that is loudest actually in the left, lower left sternal edge. And that is why when we do cardiac exam, there's one part where we ask the patient to sit up, lean forward, um, put our stethoscope on the sort of third intercostal space on the left, and then ask them to take a deep breath in and then breathe out and then hold their breath. This is to try and accentuate a AR murmur. 
And then we have pulmonary regurgitation. So this is a decrescendo early diastolic murmur as well, and it's best heard in the pulmonary area. Then we have mitral stenosis, so they call it a mid-diastolic rumble. So it's not very loud, it's quite soft, and it's best heard at the apex. And with mitral murmurs, we would like the patient to be on the left lateral position and in expiration. And that is why we try and ask the patients to roll onto the left sides so we can hear the mitral murmurs better. And lastly, tricuspid stenosis. Uh, this has an opening snap, and this is a mid-diastolic murmur, and it's best heard in a tricuspid area. Um, tricuspid stenosis is quite an uncommon murmur. It um, can be caused by conditions such as carcinoid, uh, post-infective endocarditis, or myxomas. But as you see, this condi these conditions are uncommon in itself, so tricuspid stenosis is quite uncommon too. So the next thing I want to mention is grading. Um, this is relevant, uh, especially during OSCEs um, in the future, thinking, I know like you might be third year now, you know that you, you won't be hearing real murmurs, but maybe on placements, and when you come to final year and when you do your OSCE and you hear a real murmur, you have to describe it. And one of the things you need to say is the grade. So here I have the grades and the description of the murmurs. So one is you can barely hear it. Um, if you can, uh, usually, usually if you can hear it, it's around two or three. Um, four, five, six, you can palpate the murmur. That's like it's associated with the thrill. And I've never heard of a five or six, honestly. So this is something you can read up on how to grade a murmur. Yeah. So this is just a picture that summarizes the common murmurs that you can hear and the diseases that's associated with it. Um, I'll leave the slide up here for around 10 seconds so you can appreciate what the sound waves are supposed to look like. Okay, so we're going to move on to valvular heart disease. So um, I'm just going to talk about the left heart valve disease. Um, if uh, I, because of time limitation, it'd be too much to go into the right heart valve disease as well. So I've just put in a slide to remind you that um, it's something you should you can read up on. Um, they're not very common, but you still need to know them. So with all these valvular disease, the investigations are quite similar. Um, their symptoms can be quite similar as well. I'll try not to, I won't, the information is on the slide, but I'll try not to read too much of it. So first off is aortic stenosis. Um, this is uh, quite a common murmur. It's not the most common, uh, it's a common, quite a common valvular problem, but not the most common. The most common is mitral valve prolapse. So aortic stenosis, the most common cause is senile calcification, followed by congenital bicuspid valve and also rheumatic fever. And the symptoms, so usually patients with aort aortic stenosis are asymptomatic until they, by the time they do develop symptoms, they have quite a poor prognosis. Um, so symptoms that we look up for is the triad of exertional angina, exertional syncope, and exertional dyspnea. And this is something, a differential you should think about when you take a history of loss of consciousness. Of course, there are other heart failure symptoms that the patient can get, such as PND, orthopnea, and peripheral edema as well. In terms of signs, you'd be looking out for a slow rising pulse. You'd look for just when you auscultate, you're listening for a ejection systolic murmur that radiates to the carotids. You're listening for a S4. S4 again is uh, atria contraction against the stiff ventricle, so you get hypertrophy in uh, aortic stenosis, and also a quiet A2 because your aort your valve is so stiff it can't close properly. Your A2 is quiet, 
and um, of course signs of heart failure as well. So in terms of investigation, um, echo and Doppler is diagnostic, but obviously you need to, um, you can do other investigations such as bloods to look out for other cardiovascular risk factors. ECG, it can demonstrate uh, hypertrophy, it can demonstrate strain. Chest X-ray, it can show signs of heart failure like cardiomegaly. And here I put the class, um, the classification for severe AS. Um, it's something you can learn. It's something you should know. Um, but don't be too stressed if you can't remember it. Um, because the, the parameters for this informs the management for aortic stenosis. So with aortic stenosis, if they're asymptomatic, they don't have and and there's no um, ventricular dysfunction. You just keep monitoring them, following them up, following them up with echo. I put here in red. Don't use nitrates because nitrates can uh, reduce the afterload really quickly. Basically, make them hypotensive. Um, it can be quite dangerous for aortic stenosis patients. So be very wary about nitrates. And here, as it, uh, the indications for valve replacement is severe is uh, symptomatic AS, and you basically find out whether it's severe or not with the echo and Doppler. Um, also, if it's asymptomatic but you have reduced ejection fraction, you would go for valve replacement as well. Obviously, if you're going for another procedure like cabbage, um, you might as well replace the valve, you know, two birds with one stone. And with valve replacement, it can be either mechanical or bioprosthetic, but with valve replacement, you will need warfarin afterwards. In patients who are frail, uh, who cannot undergo a surgical replacement, you can do transcatheter aortic valve implantation, or TAVI for short, and that is through cardiac catheterization. Uh, even though I put balloon valvuloplasty here, um, this is not as good as the, as the others, as the restenosis rate is high. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is aortic regurgitation. Uh, I've divided the causes between acute and chronic. So as you can see, acute would be things like aortic dissection and infective endocarditis. Chronic would be things like um, connective tissue disease, Marfan's and Ella-Danlos. Uh, congenital bicuspid aortic valve, um, rheumatic heart disease, so rheumatic fever always has a hand in causing valve problems, and then lastly autoimmune, so ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, because these, these conditions can cause aortic dilatation. Um, you'll learn more about these autoimmune conditions in fourth year, um, don't worry. So symptoms again, um, but the symptoms, by the time you do get symptoms, would be um, left ventricular failure symptoms. So exertional dyspnea, PND, orthopnea. Um, you can also get arrhythmias, especially AF, so you would get palpitations. In terms of the signs of aortic regurgitation, so you're looking for a collapsing pulse um, in, when you do the cardiac exam. There can be a displaced apex because of a dilated ventricle. Um, in terms of heart sounds, you can have a soft or absent S2 with or without S3. So the S2 is because um, your valve is not closing properly, so it's quite soft. Your aortic valve is not closing properly, so it's quite soft. And S3 is because there's a dilated ventricle due to the aortic regurgitation. In terms of murmur, um, as I said, mentioned before, it's an early diastolic murmur, and sometimes you can hear something called an Austin Flint murmur. So what is an Austin Flint murmur? So here I've put, it's a rumbling mid-diastolic murmur. It's a bit like mitral stenosis. And this happens because your regurgitant jet hits the mitral valve cusp, and it can't open properly. So it's a bit like mitral stenosis, really, where the mitral valve can't open properly, causing this Austin Flint murmur. There are these other signs as well, corrigans, demosets, uh, quinkies, I'm not sure if I've said it right. Um, they're maybe not as common nowadays, but you should still recognize these 
names and what they mean in terms of aortic regurgitation. So in terms of investigation, again, similar things, bloods, ECG, chest X-ray, and echo. Echo is always the most important in valvular disease um, because not only are you looking at the valve structure and morphology, you can look at the jet, you can look at your left ventricular function, you can see if there's thrombi in it, so echo is very important. In terms of management, um, obviously um, surgery is the definitive management for most, well, all valvular disease. And here it would be aortic valve replacement, and again, similar indications as previous AS. If you have heart failure symptoms, or if you're asymptomatic but you have left ventricular dysfunction. If the patient is not for surgery, if they're um, quite frail, then you can give them an uh, ACE inhibitor to help reduce the afterload, and it is shown to help reduce the regurgitation. So mitral valve prolapse, um, this is the most common valve problem, uh, it's especially common in young women, and it's caused by myxomatous degeneration. I'm not sure if I said it right, but I've got it here. So it's quite common in young women. And it can also um, show up in MI, in Marfan's, Ella Danlos, and in Turner syndrome. And it can be associated with uh, mitral regurgitation as well. Patients are usually asymptomatic, but sometimes they may complain of atypical chest pain or palpitations. Uh, the signs you can hear, as mentioned before, mid-systolic click and late systolic murmur. Um, and if the patient is asymptomatic or it's very mild, you don't have to do anything. Um, you can give them beta blockers if they're having symptoms. And if it's quite severe, then you would go on to surgically repair it. So moving on to mitral regurgitation. So there's quite a few causes for mitral regurgitation. As I mentioned before, mitral valve prolapse can lead to mitral regurgitation. And if you think about it, um, when if your left ventricle dilates, your mitral valve cuffs are further away from each other and doesn't close as well. So there's leak, leakage, and therefore conditions that cause left ventricle dilatation, such as um, hypertension, ARAS, they can lead to mitral regurgitation as well. Things like post-MI, um, where the papillary muscle ruptures, um, again, connective tissue disease and also rheumatic fever can cause mitral regurgitation. In terms of symptoms, um, it would be, again, heart failure symptoms, so exertional dyspnea, decreased exercise tolerance, peripheral edema, fatigue. You can get palpitations, like, but that's quite late stage. And um, in terms of signs, you can get your usual heart failure signs, you can get a displaced apex because of uh, left ventricle dilatation and uh, AF as well but again AF is quite late it happens quite late. In terms of heart sound uh, you can hear a soft you might hear a soft S1 um, this is because again the mitral valves are not closing against each other very well so S1 is quieter and sometimes with a pansystolic murmur you might not be able to hear the S2 itself. So again, investigations are quite similar from previous slides. Um, and again, echo, you, echo is diagnostic. In chest X-ray, you, you might be able to see left atrial and left ventricular hypertrophy, and the usual cardiomegaly, and also pulmonary congestion. So in terms of management, if you have atrial fibrillation, then you should manage the atrial fibrillation with rate control and anticoagulation. Um, and you should obviously give medication to help manage the heart failure symptoms, so ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and diuretics. And again, surgical management is the definitive management for mitral regurgitation. Um, you can do valve repair, so you can either put annuloplasty where they put a ring around to reshape reshape your mitral valve or you can replace the mitral valve with a mechanical valve. 
and the indications I've put there again is similar to previous ones as well. So lastly, there's mitral stenosis. So this is quite uncommon because the main cause is rheumatic fever and rheumatic fever in the UK nowadays is quite uncommon too. Uh, in terms of symptoms, again, it's your usual dyspnea, chest pain, and you're more likely to get AF and therefore palpitations in mitral stenosis. In terms of signs, um, you might be able to palpate uh, AF or low volume pulse. Um, you might be able to see malar flush, so this is just reddening of the cheeks. Uh, the JVP may be raised. And there's something called tapping apex, and basically that's a palpable S1 that you can feel. In terms of heart sounds, you can hear, as I mentioned before, a mid-diastolic rumble. So with the investigations, again, you may be able to see AF on the ECG, or if there's no AF and you can see the P wave, you might be able to see P mitrali. So P mitrali is the bifid P wave, which shows left atrial hypertrophy. In the, on the chest X-ray, you may be able to see a left atrial enlargement as well. And again, echo and Doppler is the way to go to diagnose mitral stenosis. So in terms of management, um, if you have AF, you should rate control and anticoagulate. Again, manage your heart failure. And then in terms of the definitive management, and that's surgical, if your valve itself is not very calcified, it's still pliable, you can try for percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty. If not, you can try for repair. So valvotomy, commissurotomy, is basically um, making cuts onto the valve to make it so that it's able to move again. And if repair is not possible, you replace the valve. So here I've inserted a slide to remind you that if you do have time, you should, you can read up on right heart valve disease. And these are the four ones that I've put here. So the next thing I want to move on to is infective endocarditis. And here we have a picture of the vegetations that you see in infective endocarditis. So what it is, is basically an infection leading to inflammation of the endocardium. And as a result, your cardiac valves develop vegetations. And here, who, who is at risk of getting IE? So it's people who either have existing valve problems, they have, or they have prosthetic valves, or they have congenital heart disease, so VSD, ventricular septal defect, uh, aortic coarctation, patent ductus arteriosus, hocum, and people with rheumatic fever. They're, these people are at risk. But also, if you have a normal valve, um, things like having poor dental hygiene, um, uh, I've, being an IV drug user, being immunocompromised, also puts you at risk of having IE. So in terms of etiology, I've, you can see here lots of names of bacteria. Um, <clears throat> in terms of culture positive, used, it used to be staph viridins that was quite, um, that was more common, but uh, staph aureus is now more common as a path pathogen. Um, S. bovis is if you do culture S. bovis in infective endocarditis, you need to try, uh, rule out colon cancer, colorectal cancer, because S. bovis comes from the gut. And here we have the culture negative HASEC group of bacteria. I've named them here on the slide. And this non infective cause, which is um, SLE lupus. In terms of clinical features, it's quite non-specific, uh, non so you can get fever, uh, rigors, weight loss, night sweats. So in terms of signs, um, these are the things you'll be looking up for when you do your cardiac exam. You say, I'm looking for clubbing, 
Splenomegaly is also a sign in uh, IE. Usually when you listen to the heart, there might be a new or changing murmur. Uh, MR is quite common, more common than AR. But if you're IV drug user, um, you quite you more likely to get a left heart valve disease. So it can be tricuspid regurgitation. And then um, IE can generate septic emboli as well. And these emboli um, just go throughout the entire body and de deposit in different places. So it can cause abscesses in the brain, in the kidney, in the gut. And it can, Janeway lesions are caused by embol, uh, emboli. Um, you can also have immune complex deposition. So this can cause glomerulonephritis. So you would see microhematuria. Uh, it can cause things like Roth spots, splinter hemorrhages, oslinodes. So here on the bottom left, I've put the description for the few signs that we always we, we like to mention during our exam, like Janeway lesions and Oslin nodes. Roth spots, you would need a fundoscope. It's not very easy to see. But here I have the pictures. So the first one would be Oslin nodes. This is, you can see it's on the finger pulp, it's purple, and it should be painful. And then the second one that came up on the hands, that's Janeway lesions, so they're on the palmer, they're macules. And then the nail is splinter hemorrhage. And um, the last one, it's it might not be very clear on your screen, um, that is Roth spot. So you can see those dark red areas, those are uh, retinal hemorrhages. But if you look really closely, there's quite a, in the center, there's a bit of a light spot. Then that's the pale center that they're talking about that's present in the Roth spots. Um, if you do go on the ward, if you're on, well, if you're in card cardio, or just try looking out uh, for splinter hemorrhages. I think the, the you are more likely to see splinter hemorrhages than the other stuff. So this is a very important slide um, that they could test you on, so which is Duke's criteria. And this is how you diagnose someone with IE. And for Duke's criteria, you need two major criteria or one major plus three minor, or five minor criteria. And here we have it. So major would be either a positive blood culture or a positive echo. And you have to pay attention to the blood culture bit because they have specific timings. And like you need to do two cultures. They've been more than 12 hours apart, or maybe three samples more than one hour apart. Um, they're quite particular about that. In terms of positive echo, you might be see, you can see vegetation. You might see an abscess. Um, you might see new valve regurgitation. And in terms of minor criteria, it'd be things like oh, if the, is this person predisposed to having IE? Uh, so having risk factors, uh, is that fever? If they have any of the signs that we mentioned before, and if they have a positive blood culture, but you know they they do, just don't fall into the major criteria. So since I've mentioned a lot about you know the diagnostic criteria in the investigations, what we obviously have to do is, of course, we have to do um, cultures. Usually they do three within an hour, like more than an hour apart. Um, you can also do bloods as well. Um, it's usually a normochromic, uh, normocytic anemia. If you are thinking about unusual organisms, you can do serology. And if you do a urine urinalysis, you might be able to find microhematuria as well. Looking for red cell, you can you might be able to see red cell casts too. Um, sometimes IE can cause conductive system problems. So in, on the ECG, you might see something like AV block or a prolonged PR interval, but it can vary. Like it does not it does not have to be present, but it can show up on the ECG. But really, the most diagnostic thing you can do, again, is echo. So this is either transthoracic or transesophageal. Um, I've seen transesophageal. Uh, it's more, as I said here, it's more sensitive, but some patients can't tolerate it. So 
you have to try and balance that out. And the treatment, um, you should give them IV antibiotics for a minimum of four weeks, um, a six weeks if there's prosthetic valve or if there's uh, abscess. And I, t I took these antibiotic antibiotics from the BNF. Um, I'm I'm not sure if local trust guidelines are different, but this is what the BNF says. So start off with if you don't know anything, if you don't know what is causing it, uh, for a normal valve you give amox, prosthetic you give vanc, rifampicin, and low dose gent. So if it's staph and it, if you find out it's staph, you switch it to flucloxacillin. If it's strep, it doesn't matter if it's your your normal valve or your prosthetic valve, you give benzyl penicillin. And enterococci, you give amoxicillin and low-dose gent or benpen and low-dose gent. And if it's any of the HACEC ones, you give amox and low-dose gent. Obviously, if it's a prosthetic valve, um, if you might consider, you know, you have to take the valve out and replace it because leaving it in there is just leaving the source of infection there. Uh, if you have heart failure, if you have abscess, if you, um, if you have embolic, embolic phenomenon, so such as if you keep having it despite antibiotics, then you should consider surgery. So the next thing I want to talk about is rheumatic fever. Um, I mentioned before that it's not common anymore in the UK. It's more you see it more in developing countries. However, uh, we have to talk about it because, well, in the previous slides, when I talked about all the valve disease, uh, rheumatic fever always shows up, and you also need to learn about the Jones criteria. Um, so rheumatic fever, the cause is group A beta hemolytic strep, and usually this um, beta hemolytic strep causes scarlet fever, and the complication will be rheumatic fever. In terms of diagnosis, we have another criteria called the Jones criteria, and don't confuse it with Dukes. For this criteria, you need evidence of group A strep infection plus two major criteria, or evidence of group A strep plus one major plus two minor. Okay, so the evidence of group A strep infection would include if you have recent scarlet fever, if you have a positive throat culture, if you have, if you take blood tests and you look for rapid strep antigen test or anti-streptolysin O titers, or ASOP for short, so this is, these can demonstrate a group A strep infection. In terms of major criteria, we have pancarditis, so having pericarditis, myocarditis, and endocarditis. If you have migratory arthritis, so red hot swollen joint, and it like moves, it goes to other joints. Subcutaneous nodules are painless nodules on extensor surfaces. Erythema marginatum, I have a picture here. Um, yeah, and syndromes chorea, chorea. It's basically a neurological symptom where you have jerky movement in the limbs as well as hypertonia and facial grimacing. So these are the major criteria. In terms of minor criteria, it would be fever, raised inflammatory markers, arthralgia, which is just joint pain, but not necessarily a joint inflammation. So just pain, but no, maybe no swelling and it's not hot. Prolonged PR interval is one of them, and also previous rheumatic fever. Oh, sorry, that was, I put it in the wrong place. Anyway. Investigations, so obviously we want to follow that criteria. So a throat swab, or you can just do bloods looking for strep antigen or the anti-streptolysin O titer. That can help prove that you have a group A strep infection. And then obviously ESR and CRPs constitutes as a minor criteria. Then you should do an ECG, which can show prolonged PR interval and also um, S, uh, ST elevation um, due to pericarditis as well. So that's a saddle-shaped ST elevation that can show up. And 
you can look at echo as well to look for new signs of endocarditis and any valvular dysfunction. For management, um, I put bed rest, and that is a management because you don't want to push someone into heart failure if they're too active, so they should be resting. Um, benzyl penicillin is the antibiotic, and you should give it for 10 days. And because they're symptomatic with pain, you should give them analgesia, aspirin, or NSAIDs. You, you can add oral prednisolone if they have signs of heart failure, if, they, if you see cardiomegaly, they're third degree heart block. So next thing we're going to talk about is heart failure, which is a big topic in itself. So to put it simply, heart failure is the heart is unable to generate adequate cardiac output to meet demands. There's a lot of causes for heart failure. And again, with causes, we like to try and divide them up. So I've divided them like this. So pump failure, so the heart is unable to pump properly. Um, and here I've put systolic failure and diastolic failure and arrhythmia. Systolic failure basically just means the heart can, cannot contract well just cannot pump well. So it's things like ischemia, having a myocardial infarct, causing um, heart muscle damage, causing uh, impaired contraction. After myocarditis, in, you know, dilated cardiomyopathy, these things cause contraction to become impaired. For diastolic failure, um, there's impaired filling. So blood cannot fill the heart well. And these are things like restrictive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or in acute cases, um, tamponade or pericardial effusion. Arrhythmias is another thing that means that the heart does not pump well. So that's things like you, if your heart rate is really slow, if it's really fast, if you have heart block, those are things that mean your heart can't pump well and it can lead to heart failure. And antiarrhythmics such as verapamil, they have a negative anotropic effect, which means that they weaken contraction. So again, this can exacerbate heart failure. And on the right, you can see excessive preload and afterload. So if you have too much blood, too much um, fluid filling the heart itself, so this can cause heart failure as well. So con conditions such as AR and MR. Excessive afterload is increased resistance, so increased impedance, and the heart has to work harder to pump blood out. So that's AS, if you have hypertension, if you have Holcomb, those are things that increase afterload and can cause heart failure. Lastly, there's uh, the group of high output conditions. So you have to generate a lot more cardiac output. So if you're pregnant, if you have hyperthyroidism, if you're anemic, if you have beriberi from thiamine deficiency, and if you have Paget's, uh, if you don't treat it, you can develop heart failure as well. So the pathophysiology of heart failure. Um, so I'm going to try and explain it with the help of the rubber bands on the right. But first of all, when you have poor ventricular function, less blood is flowing to your kidneys, you have poorer renal perfusion, your kidneys think that you know you 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 don't have enough fluid in, in your body. You are, your blood pressures. They need to maintain your blood pressure, so they activate the RAS system. And as we know, with the RAS system activated, you get vasoconstriction, you get salt and fluid retention, and you activate your sympathetic nervous system, which is bad because with vasoconstriction you increase your afterload. With fluid retention, you're increasing your preload and you're developing edema. And with um, sympathetic nervous system activation, you're increasing your heart rate, increasing your contraction, um, you're working your heart even more, and it can cause myocyte damage. So Starling's Law from year one or year two um, says that contractile function is dependent on velocity of muscle contraction, load moved, an amount of stretch. So if you have more fluid in your heart, there will be more stretch and your heart will contract more in order to move the fluid out. 
if you think of it a bit like rubber bands as, or hair ties, assuming that they won't snap, okay, when you first get them, they're really stretchy and you're stretching them and you stretch them, they recall back to the normal size. But after you stretch them past a certain point, they become lax, like they, go, they don't go back to the normal form anymore. They're not that, you know, elastic anymore. And this is sort of what happens in heart failure as well. Um, as I see here is the actual Starling's Law diagram. You can see in heart failure, the contractile state is just much lower because um, with your increased preload, you're just contracting more and more until you decompensate. You stretch past that point, you're stretch, overstretched. So your heart is not efficient is not no longer contracting efficiently to uh, produce the cardiac output anymore. So with a heart failure, um, most of the times when we talk about heart failure, it's congestive heart failure, or oftentimes it's left ventricular failure. And the symptoms of that would be things, as we mentioned before, um, orthopnea, PND, exertional dyspnea, and falling exercise tolerance. Um, they will show signs of fluid overload, which would be raised JVP, um, S3, as we mentioned before. Um, you'll be able to hear signs of pulmonary uh, edema, so bilateral basal crepitations in the lungs. You can get peripheral sacral edema and pink frothy sputum, and that's also because of pulmonary edema. Um, you can see hepatomegaly there. Um, hepatomegaly is more of a right heart failure sign. As you can see, I've put pure right heart failure causes. Um, it can ca be caused by ASD or pulmonary hypertension. And if you just have right heart failure, the signs you can get would therefore also, it, it, it would include splenomegaly, ascites um, as well. In terms of classification of heart failure, um, we talk about ejection fraction a lot. So reduced ejection fraction would be if your ejection fraction was less than 40%, and this shows this systolic heart failure. So as we mentioned before, it's because the heart isn't pumping, isn't contracting well. If you have preserved ejection fraction, and that is ejection fraction greater than 50%, is diastolic heart failure, and that is because there's impaired filling of the heart. And we mentioned before, it could be things like restrictive or hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy. In terms of severity of your heart failure, we talk about the, sorry, the New York Heart Association classification. So that's uh, talking about breathlessness, dyspnea. Class 1 is if you don't have symptoms. Class 2 is if it's breathless on, breathlessness on exertion. Class 3 is um, if... It happens with minimal exertion, and four if is if you get symptoms when you're at rest. So here, in terms of investigations, assuming you know nothing about this patient, you don't know why they have heart failure, um, you'd be looking after you've done history exam. You do bloods first, and I'd like to direct your attention to BNP because BNP is a good marker to rule out heart failure and also serves as a prognostic marker as well. Um, if a patient comes in uh, with acute dyspnea and you're worried that it could be heart failure, if you do BNP and the value is low, then you're sure it's not heart failure. Um, at the same time, if someone is in with heart failure um, and they're treated for it, the BNP will go down and this the value can guide you on when you can discharge your patient. Um, TFTs I've put there because thyrotoxicosis can be a cause of heart failure. And then ferritin, uh, hemochromatosis is, can cause heart failure as well. It's an uh, infiltrative disease, cardiac disease. Um, immunoglobulin, autoimmune profile would be any autoimmune causes behind um, heart failure. And um, CK would be, think, would you be looking into any myopathies. In terms of the chest X-ray for heart failure, um, sure um, you might have heard of A, B, C, D, E. So A is alveolar edema, which we like to call it bat wing edema, um, which you can 
maybe see on the picture here the blue pulmonary edema here and then uh, B is curly B lines so I used to think they were curly but no they're just called curly B and they're actually straight lines they're not curly lines C is cardiomegaly so if the the ratio of the heart and your thorax is greater than 0 0.5 that's cardiomegaly um, make sure that your film is the right way around because you can't comment on it if it's AP. D is uh, upper lobe diversion or here it's called it says cephalization so it becomes you can see the vessels more they become more prominent and lastly E is effusions so pleural effusions so these are signs of heart failure you will also do an ECG an ECG is to look at again it can help tell you what the cause of the heart failure is so it can be AF it could you could possibly see Q waves that show a previous MI you can sh it can show ischemia as well and echo is the thing that you use to determine you know what the function is like whether there's valve problems whether there's septal defects and lastly the other other investigations is if the previous ones um, don't yield any useful information. So things like halter monitoring for long-term uh, monitoring of ca uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Cardiac MRI can be for infiltration, infiltrative diseases. Lung function tests if you're thinking of um, COPD leading to pulmonary hypertension, things like that. So the management of chronic heart failure, to start off with, non-medical management tell them to stop smoking and tell them to cut down on the salt and water intake um, you don't want them to be fluid overloaded so that's why you should tell them to reduce the amount of fluids they take every day you can encur encourage them to go for um, rehab exercise like cardiac rehab they call it and it's basically an exercise program to help them with their um, exercise tolerance like hopefully increase the exercise tolerance and if you find the cause of the heart failure then you should definitely treat it because it can definitely help with the symptoms for example in aortic stenosis in aortic stenosis if you replace the valve um, their ejection fraction improves and the symptoms improve greatly as well so that's one thing you can do and then the first line for heart failure first line management you give them ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and a loop diuretic, most likely frostmide. Um, if they can't tolerate uh, ACE inhibitor, you give ARB. And then you start on a low dose, and then you keep up titrating it until the maximum dose. And if this doesn't work, then you think about adding spironolactone. And with ACE inhibitor, ARB, and spironolactone, uh, look out for hyperkalemia because these predispose um, these drugs increase the potassium in the blood. If you if the patient can't tolerate ACE inhibitor or ARB, then you can consider giving them vasodilators such as hydralazine. Uh, you should think about getting specialist input as well. And third line, if those don't work, you think about digoxin, which if they have AF is quite useful. Uh, you think about cardiac resynchronization therapy with or without a, a defibrillator and you can also co uh, consider Everbradin if your heart rate is still above 70 even with all the medication that you've had before and then there's this thing called ARNI A -R -N -I. it's angiotensin receptor neptralicillin inhibitor Basically, it's these two drugs, Secupitril and Valsartan. And they're a third-line drug, basically, for heart failure. So you just really need to know that there are these options for third-line. You should avoid verapamil and diltiazem in chronic heart failure. And the reason I've mentioned before that it has a negative inotropic effect, which means that it weakens the heart contraction and it therefore it will exacerbate heart failure. 
so don't give it. And lastly, invasive therapies wise, um, we're thinking like left ventricular assist device or heart transplant. And usually, previously, the left ventricular assist device is a bridging, bridging device. So people were put on it while they were waiting for a heart transplant. But now it can be a destination therapy, which means a permanent therapy. However, this would be for patients um, with very severe heart failure. So if someone comes in with acute heart failure, what, how we manage it is through A, B, C, D, E, as usual, how we manage any unwell patients. So assuming that their airway is open, we move on to B. B, if the SATs are less than 94%, then you can give them um, 50 newton, um oxygen via the res reservoir mask. And you should check ABG because if they are acidotic, you might think about non-invasive ventilation. And if they have type 2 respiratory failure and they basically reduce consciousness or exhausted, then you have to consider invasive ventilation. C, um, circulation. So you start giving them IV access and you also check their ECG as well. So at that point, if you find any arrhythmias, you should try and treat it. Also, you take bloods as well. Um, and as I mentioned again, troponin to see if an MI is the cause behind the acute heart failure. Uh, you can do BMP and you also ABG as well. Now, nitrates you can only give if there's myocardial ischemia, severe hypertension, yeah, because nitrates can drop the blood pressure really quickly. Um, you need to keep an eye on the blood pressure and you won't give it if you don't have those indications. The definitive management really for acute heart failure is to give IV diuretics. Um, and that's usually frostamide. If, however, you give frosmite and like nothing changes, it doesn't work, patient doesn't get better, um, if you can confirm that the patient is diuretic resistant, then you have to consider ultrafiltration. If the blood pressure is low, you have to treat this as card cardiogenic shock, and you have to think about adrenaline or dobutamine, these kind of vasopressor inotropes. And as I said, treat your underlying precipitants. And while they're at the hospital, what you should monitor would be the blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, JVP. JVP would show what their fluid status is like. Urine output, ABG, the renal function. Yeah, using ease. And lastly, once they've been stabilized, if they don't need to be on IV diuretics anymore, you can restart or restart them on their beta blocker treatment. So next thing I'm going to talk about is acute circulatory failure and shock. So the definition of shock is basically life-threatening maldistribution of blood flow. And therefore, there's a failure to deliver or use adequate amounts of oxygen. And therefore, there's tissue hypoxia. In terms of when we talk about circulatory failure, we're talking about these type of shocks. So cardiogenic, obstructive, distributive, and hypovolemic. So here I have the different causes of shock. There's cardiogenic, we can see there's MI, heart failure, valvular dysfunction, arrhythmia, aortic dissection. Distributive would be things, you know, leaky pipe, as we call it, so sepsis and anaphylaxis. Obstructive shock would be a blocked pipe, so things like pulmonary embolism or any type of emboli, tension pneumothorax or cardiac tamponade. That would be cause obstructive shock. Cardiogenic shock would be like the pump not working. Yeah, If you think of the vascular system as the pump and pipe system. So hypovolemic shock, there's not enough things in the pipe that can be caused by hemorrhage, dehydration, burns. The reason why I have our Prime Minister here playing tennis um, is because you have to learn about the classification of uh, hemorrhage. So I've been reliably told, because I don't play tennis, that the blood loss um, 
numbers correspond to tennis scores, 15, 15 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 percent. And as you can see in class one, if you lose less than 50 percent of blood, not much changes really. But as you go from, from class one up to class four, as you lose more, heart rate increases, blood pressure goes down, respiratory rate increases, urine output goes down, you become pale, your, you, your peripheral uh, capillaries all shut down, you become cold, and you just don't have enough blood to your brain, you become confused and unconscious. Um, I won't go through each individual value, you can look back at this when you have time. But this is something you should know. So how do you recognize if the patient is in shock? So first of all, of course, you look at the patient, you start off with their hands, and you, if there's shock, you might get clinical signs such as they cold, they clammy, they're confused. Then next thing you can check, of course, is blood pressure. But the body is quite good at maintaining blood pressure, so a low blood, ple blood pressure can be a late sign. So taking this from my third year lecture, um, the lecturer said that Systolic blood pressure and MAP is a good sign to look for during shock. And if you don't remember how to calculate MAP, the formula is right there next to it. Uh, pulse, you can check that, that you'll be, the patient will be tachycardic. Uh, raised respiratory rate, urine output. So normally, it would be 0 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour. In a normal 70 kilogram male, this would be 35 mils. So as you saw in the previous slide, if it's less than 30, something's not right. And then when you look at ABG or VBG, you're looking at things like lactate, like base excess, because these things are marker of tissue hypoxia, of anaerobic metabolism. So if lactate is greater than 2, or if base excess is greater than minus 6, then you're starting to think, you know, hang on, is this patient shocked? There's tissue hypoxia. There could be tissue hypoxia. So with all unwell patients, you start with the A, B, C, D, E approach. So assuming that the airway is open, you move on to breathing. So again, if SAT's less than 94%, give them oxygen, 15%, 15 meters. Circulation, um, you give them two large bro cannulas and fluids. So resuscitation fluids would be 500 mils, 0.9% saline, in less than 15 minutes, ideally. If they're bleeding out, give them blood products. And obviously, you're trying to look for the cause while you're doing all of this, so remember to take bloods and check urine output. Other investigations I've put here are things you would do to exclude your, um, well, to find out the cause or also to exclude conditions. So. If you do chest x-ray, you might be able to find tension pneumothorax. Hopefully, that's not the case. Um, if you do ultrasound, especially fast scan, you're looking for internal bleeding. And I put urine HCG because um, I'm thinking specifically hemorrhage. Um, in young women who have ectopic pregnancy, you know, they could be ble internally bleeding. With any young women, do urine HCG. Um, if if their blood pressure is not going up, then you have to think about doing inotropes and vasopressors like adrenaline, dobutamine. Obviously, if the patient comes in and they have angioedema, you hear, listen to their lungs and there's a wheeze and there's obvious allergen contact, then you'd be thinking anaphylactic shock and you give adrenaline very quickly. Also, speaking at that point when you're as an F1, when you're working, you probably also call your senior as well. So the last, I'm approaching the end here, and I understand, you know, there's a lot of things I could still be talking about, but we don't have a lot of time. So I've put a slide at the end as well as to what topics you can study a reader on your own, which I won't go through today. So Pericarditis is something we do need to know. Um, most commonly caused, is, it could be idiopathic, it could be viral. Um, it, it's also a complication of an MI. Uh, 
um, Dresslers, as I've put there, is a autoimmune pericarditis that happens around two weeks after an MI. If you have chronic kidney disease and it's quite severe, you can get uremic pericarditis, which is an indication for dialysis as well. In terms of features of pericarditis, it's quite classically a central chest pain, which is worse when you lie down, but it's better when you lean forward, and it's sharp and pleuritic in nature. Um, you might hear a pericardial friction rub, um, and you might uh, there might be signs of effusion or tamponade, and you should look up what Beck's triad is. In terms of investigation, um, the ECG would show will could show a saddle shaped ST elevation with or without a PR depression. And with the bloods, you're trying to look for a cause for the pericarditis. For most pericarditis, because if they are viral, if the cause is viral, you will manage it with analgesia, just ibuprofen and colchicine. And if there's any other underlying systemic causes, then you treat that. Second line would be steroids. Okay, so next slide, cardiomyopathy. This is a very complicated topic. Um, there's lots of causes of cardiomyopathy. I'm trying. To, I'm just going to explain a few of the common causes and, you know, the big groups of cardiomyopathy. So there's dilated cardiomyopathy, where the all four chambers become dilated. Um, it can be an idiopathic cause. It can be genetic, um, alcohol excess, um, the use of doxorubicin can cause a dilated cardiomyopathy. And patients with that get progressive um, heart failure. And the management really is transplantation. For uh, You manage the heart failure, but definitively it will be transplantation. For hypertrophic heart, there's lots of other causes of hypertrophic heart, but here I'm just talking about Holcomb, um, where there's a disproportionate thickening of the septal myocardium. And this can be an autosomal, autosomal dominant condition, um, but it can be sporadic mutation as well. So just because they don't have a family history does not mean that they don't have Hoka. Um, in this case, you know, the left ventricle is smaller in size, there's outflow obstruction, and patients can develop symptoms such as exertional syncope, angina, palpitations, dyspnea. And it's a cause of sudden death in young people. The management, you'd consider beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. But also, surgically, you'd think about either septal ablation or like surgically opening up myomectomy, cutting the septum. And you can consider um, ICDs as well. Last one, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, it's either idiopathic or it can be secondary to a lot of things such as amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, radiation. And um, again, there's lots of causes I haven't put here, but definitively uh, transplant, heart transplantation would be the definitive management. So last bit, congenital cardiovascular disease. So... I'm just going to mention three today, there's a bit more, and you will talk about it more when you do pediatrics in fourth year. So ASD, um, patients are often asymptomatic until they're adults because as you age, the left ventricle becomes less compliant and so your left to right shunt increases. And the symptoms that you get would be um, d dyspnea, chest pain, palpitations, and um, at its worst, pulmonary hypertension. You yeah, and signs-wise, you get AF, raised JVP, and the murmur for ASD is an ejection systolic murmur with a fixed split S2 that's best heard in the pulmonary area. So this is one where you have a split S2, which doesn't change when you breathe in or out. So the complication for ASD is Isomendra syndrome. So that's when your right atrium pressure increases so much that it becomes a right to left shunt, you'll get pulmonary hypertension and cyanosis, and this is irreversible. 
As with other congenital cardiovascular disease, it also increases the risk of IE. Um, so you can see in the investigations, like if it's very severe uh, ASD, you get right axis deviation, you get prominent pulmonary vascular marking, and again, echo is diagnostic. To manage it, you close it, either tra like transcatheter or surgical closure. So VSD, um, it can be congenital or post-MI, and here we're talking about congenital, so it either shows up in the infant with severe heart failure, or you find out later in life. The smaller the VSD, the louder the murmur. I've talked about the murmur before, so I'll move on. And again, the complications are similar to ASD. You will also get isomenges as well. As you can see, you can also do ECG, chest X-ray, and echo. And ECG might show uh, left ventricle and right ventricle hypertrophy. Again, management is similar, transcatheter or surgical closure. Last one is patent ductus arteriosus. So this is common in premature neonates or uh, babies that were born in hypoxic conditions. And normally, we all have a ductus arteriosus and when we are fetus, it, the shunt goes from right to left. But after you're born, your the ductus arterios, arteriosus is supposed to close. But if it doesn't close, the shunt becomes left to right, and oxygen, oxygenated blood flows into the pulmonary artery. Um, the symptoms that you get with that would be the baby fails to thrive and they have shortness of breath. And the murmur that you hear with PDA would be a machine-like continuous murmur that is best heard underneath the left clavicle. And uncorrected, again, it can develop into pulmonary hypertension. So to manage it, um, because the ductus arteriosus is opened up by prostaglandin, if you give an endomethacin, which is the NSAID, which is a prostaglandin inhibitor, hopefully it can end the patency. If that doesn't work, you can go for a non-invasive route, so that's a PDA occluder, and if if that doesn't work, then you go into surgical ligation. So here I have a slide on revision. So these are the things you can read up on in terms of, and things I haven't gone through today. So myocarditis, um, pericardial effusion and tamponade, uh, coarctation and TOF, tetralogy of phthalate. So now I have some questions here that's um, related to the stuff that we've gone through today. Um, I can't see your answers, but I'll just give you some time to think through it, um, and then I'll explain it. So the first question is, on the cardiology ward, you perform a cardiac examination on a patient. You hear an ejection systolic murmur, which is louder when performing Valsava maneuver. What is the cause of the murmur? So moving on to the next slide, so the answer is B, hokum. So hokum is uh, ejection systolic murmur that is louder on Valsava. If we look at the other ones, mitral regurgitation is not a ejection systolic murmur. Atrial septal defect would be ESM, but you would hear fixed, S2, fixed split F, S2. For AS, um, it's quieter when you perform Valsalva. And mitral valve prolapse, that's a late systolic murmur. So next question. Which of the following patients would be most likely to have a pathological third heart sound? So a patient with constrictive pericarditis, or a healthy young adult. C, a patient with mitral stenosis. D, a patient with chronic mitral regurgitation or E, a patient with severe aortic stenosis.
So D, chronic mitral regurgitation is the answer. This is because there's chronic left ventricular volume overload. So you get left ventricle dilatation and you get left ventricle failure. So you're most likely to get S3. In severe aortic stenosis, you get S4. So question three. Mr. X was admitted to the ward after an MI episode five days ago. He's now complaining of acute onset of dyspnea. On examination, a pansystolic murmur can be heard, which radiates to the axilla. What is the structure that is damaged? So A, ventricular septum, B, papillary muscle, C, corda tendine, D, tricuspid valve, E, atrial septum. So the answer is B, papillary muscle. So the murmur that was described in the question is basically a mitral regurgitation murmur. And as we mentioned before, this can happen post-MI, and it's due to papillary muscle uh, rupture. And if it didn't radiate to the axilla, if it was just a pansystolic murmur, it could be a VSD caused by MI. And in that case, that would be um, ventricle septum that was damaged. Um, Corda tendony damage is most more likely in things like mitral valve prolapse, um, and is not really damaged by MI. So Mr. Y is a known chronic heart failure patient. He is currently on ramipril, bisoprolol, spironolactone, furosemide, and ARNI. His other medications also include etovastatin as aspirin. Which medication does not improve prognosis in heart failure? So the answer is A, furosemide. All the other ones improve prognosis, but um, loop diuretic doesn't. It's just to improve um, the symptoms. So question five is which is which of the following is the best therapy for acute pericarditis? So So the correct answer is A, NSAID and cortisine, as we mentioned in the slide for pericarditis. Corticosteroids is not first line. Um, question six. So according to Duke's criteria, which of the following patients is most likely to have infective endocarditis? So quite a lot of words, but first, the patient in whom the manifestation